This conference will now be recorded. Hello, I am Jatamio Kennedy, and this is the Stonewall Riots and Marsha P. Johnson, the Saint of Christopher Street. Marsha P. Johnson was a Black gender variant human rights activist. Back at a time when not only was every fiber of her existence perceived as a threat to America, but at a time when little was known about gender expression as well. Rather than hide who she was, she chose to bravely stare adversity in the face and unapologetically be herself throughout her short life until the day of her undetermined death on July 6th, 1992, at the young age of 46. Because the lack of pronoun visibility at that time, we are unable to know Marsha's preferred pronouns. And for the case of this conversation, we will refer to her using the pronouns she used to identify herself at that time. Marsha is known for her tireless work with the gay liberation movement. Sylvia Rivera, a longtime friend, and Marsha co-founded and established the Star House or Street Transvestites Action revolutionaries, which at the time operated as a shelter for queer and trans street kids in need of food, shelter, and community in the 1970s. Reformed in 2000 and now helps queer people in both healthcare and the prison system. It should be noted that transvestites is no longer an acceptable term and is actually considered a derogatory slur towards transhumans. Marsha struggled with her mental health and the appropriate care for her symptoms. She was a person living with a positive HIV diagnosis and was a devout AIDS activist working with charities like ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, where she fought to improve the lives of people living with AIDS throughout direct action and advocacy to change legislation and increase health care for the queer community of the 1980s and beyond. She performed with drag performance troops like Hot Peaches and the Angels of Light. She fought for queer visibility, equality, and for the justice and basic human rights of the queer community in large. She marched in the very first Pride March on June 28, 1970, often described by many to be saint-like and the saint of Christopher Street or even the mayor of Christopher Street. Marsha loved talking to people performing, dancing, and singing. She was loved and respected by so many in her community. She brought light and positivity to the dark daily experiences that the community in Greenwich Village endured. Martin Boyce in the Pay It No Mind feature about Marsha's life stated, her experience was the living embodiment of human rights. You're black, you're acting as a female, the law is against you, the size against you. Everything is against you in those days. Marsha was born on August 24th, 1945 in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Growing up in a family of nine people in a predominantly poor black neighborhood in Elizabeth introduced Marsha at a very young age to harassment, often by her own family, physical and sexual abuse by the hands of local kids in her neighborhood, as well as violence from both her home and her neighborhood. Marsha knew from a very young age that it was not always safe to be openly you. So she left, said the hell with you all, and after her graduation from what is now called Thomas A. Edison's Career and Technical Academy, Marsha scraped together $15 and a bag of clothes and headed for New York City's Greenwich Village in the 1966. The 1960s brought social and economic and civil revolutions unlike anything the country had experienced before. Movements like the Black Civil Rights Movement, spawning legislative change through the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the boycott and protesting of the Vietnam War and the Cold War, the Women's Liberation Movement, which worked to expand women's rights in large across the country. By the 1960s, well over 70,000 people had participated in demonstrations protests, sit-ins, teachings, and marches for a better America. There was no mistaking that the world was buzzing for change and New York was no different. New York was predominantly wealthy and white before the Second World War. After the World War, 
and coupled with the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, New York City began to shift. More and more diverse ethnic cultures began to make New York their home. Shown here is the Upper East Side. On the right hand side is Harlem. Soon, the city's poorest districts began to overflow as minorities were classically given lower wages and were denied access to higher paying jobs. The state, often leaving these neighborhoods in extreme poverty and disarray as well. They instilled segregating housing patterns, which ensured a racially segregated school system with little to no funding and very limited educational resources as well. The state instilling the NYPD as hyper vigilant protectors of the surrounding districts of the wealthy white only furthering the wealth and color divide. There were riots, marches, and protests in Harlem and Brooklyn due to police brutality towards communities of Black people and other communities of color. A Lieutenant Thomas Gillian of the NYPD shot and killed a 15-year-old Black child in 1964. There was the killing of Malcolm X in Washington Heights, there was also the citywide garbage strike of 1968. There was the Brooklyn protesting of the atomic weapons in the Cold War in 1962. There were the New York City rent strikes of 1963 and 1964, calling for lower rent and better conditions for the districts segregated by minorities. There was the boycott conducted by approximately 460,000 students refused to go to school in 1964 due to the unkept promise of the New York City's Education Board to finally desegregate schools based on a law made in 1920 that made segregated schools illegal in New York City. In 2014, a ULC UCLA study found that the New York City has still some of the most segregated schools in the country with high concentrations of Black and Latino students still isolated in their neighborhood schools. By the early 1960s, a campaign by order of Mayor Robert F. Wagner Jr. to rid New York City of all gay bars was in full effect. Mayor Wagner facilitated this campaign as he was concerned about the image of the city in preparation for the 1964 World's Fair. This was the New York that Marsha rode the bus into in 1966. Marsha arrived in Greenwich Village and began staying at any place that would let her in. She was able to secure a place to stay periodically, staying under a florist table in the back room of the shop. She would often take fresh flower clippings and construct beautiful crowns that she would wear out often that same night. Due to the limited work available to poor queers of color at that time, Marsha became a sex worker, also referred to as survival sex work. Survival sex work is sex works performed, performed due to the extreme need for the most basic human necessities. It is very dangerous and extremely unsafe. Marsha had been shot while working and due to the bullet being too close to her spine, doctors did not remove it for fear that she would become paralyzed. She lived with that bullet in her back until the day she died. Risking her life and safety for so little in return, Marsha would often turn the money she earned right back into her community. She gave you the shirt off her back, said Victoria Cruz. If she received a check on Friday, by Sunday, she had no money because she was giving it away, buying people food, helping. As Marsha found herself quickly adapting to life in Greenwich, she found a local gay watering hole. She dressed to impress and attempted to get in. The Stonewall Inn's typical clientele was predominantly gay men and lesbian women. Many gender variant queers or men in full drag, many of which lived on the street, lived in extreme poverty or slept in Christopher Street Park across the street, were denied entry at the bouncer's discretion. After many failed attempts, Marsha was finally granted access into the Stonewall Inn and became one of the first gender variant queers to do so. After a short time of successfully making it in, she became a regular. Someone began calling her Marsha, which then turned into Black Marsha. She loved the name Marsha, so she decided to keep it. 
adding the P for her classic phrase, pay it no mind, and then coupling that with Johnson after the Howard Johnson Hotel she frequently stayed in. Thus, Marsha P. Johnson was reborn and the Stonewall Inn quickly became her home. Stormy Day LaFere, a black androgynous queer woman. Jackie Hermona, a white gender variant human. Zazu Nova, a black trans woman. Sylvia Rivera, a Latinx queer gender variant human and closest friend, Marsha P. Johnson, were named among the first black and Latinx queers and trans identified humans that were the leaders in the battle against the police at the Stonewall Inn. In direct response to the harassment, the violence, and the injustice they experienced daily, not only by the hands of the New York Police Department and New York in large, but for the marginalized queer communities all over the world in the 1960s. Located in Manhattan in the district of Greenwich Village and owned by the Mafia, the Stonewall Inn was one, only one of two gay establishments that allowed dancing. Here is a full list of the songs played on the jukebox in the Stonewall Inn. This allowance attracted a less modest queer clientele and created a space where queer people could dance and mingle, flirt and express their sexuality. Most gay bars in Greenwich were owned by the mafia at that time, often paying off the police to avoid a liquor license. The mafia saw the queer community as something they could exploit, often watering down drinks and overpricing them, not maintaining the physical upkeep of the bar. There were no fire exits. Used glasses were rinsed in dirty dishwater and then immediately refilled. Toilets were constantly in and out of service and overflowing, leaving its condition overall inhumane. Yet the Stonewall Inn for many was a home that they could finally call their own. New York police conducted raids, horrific beatings, and unnecessary arrests weekly at the Stonewall Inn. The lights would go up, signaling that a raid was about to take place. Officers would storm in and line up the patrons. People who did not have at least three articles of clothing that matched their gender assigned at birth were arrested on the spot. Anyone caught dancing or touching another human of the same sex was immediately arrested. If, re if you refused to show ID or did not have ID, you were arrested. See, at that time, not only was their existence not socially acceptable, but it was also illegal. And it is still illegal in 75 countries to this day, 10 of which are punishable by death. The standard procedure was to divide and force the queer patrons into different rooms within the bar so that officers could check their gender identity and make arrests if they had been found not dressing to their gender birth marker. Many queer people were forced by officers to expose their genitalia. Many were sexually groped and abused by officers in the process. Around 1.20 a.m. on the morning of June 28, 1969, an untipped raid was conducted at the bar. Standard raid procedure began to take place, but this time, the queer patrons refused to go with the officers and refused to present their identification. One trans woman was recalled beating an officer over the head with her purse as he tried to detain her. As queer patrons fought police as they were being arrested, a crowd comprised of the surrounding queer community in Greenwich began to form outside the bar. Stormy De La Fiere had been arrested again and shoved in a police wagon. He escaped and fought back against the four police officers who attempted to detain her. Protesting that her handcuffs were too tight, she received a blow to the head from one officer's baton in response. As blood ran down her face, as she struggled and fought endlessly to be free, Stormy looked around at the crowd surrounding her. The many scared and excited and angry faces of color and queer identity, she had had enough. Her community had had enough. Stormy shouted, why don't you do something? In response, an unconfirmed queer individual threw a brick at the officer, exploding the scene and the surrounding community 
into a monumentous rebellion that spanned several days over a week's period that was the Stonewall Riots. The queer community of Greenwich Village found and fought the police in any way that they could to reclaim their community from the oppressive forces of the mafia who own the Stonewall. Also, the systematic injustice and prejudice they experienced at the hands of the NYPD and society in large. For three long days and nights, the queer community did whatever they could to rebel, throwing Molotov cocktails, flipping responding police cars, using parking meters as battering rams, constructing kick lines to push back the police, fighting with bricks, heels, bare hands, and purses. During the riots, many non-queer allies fought alongside their queer neighbors, turning what started as a couple hundred into thousands. The Stonewall riots and the various supporting uprisings post the rebellion sparked the gay liberation movement and marked the beginning of a long uphill battle for equality, visibility, and for the rights of the LGBTQ plus communities of the United States. After the Stonewall riots, queer publications began to circulate. The Gay Activist Alliance or GAA was formed the GAA, often using confrontational political tactics known as ZAPs, used to corner political figures into expressing their views on queer rights and visibility in America on the spot and publicly. Demonstrations and protests continued to emerge as queer bars in the area were continually raided all over New York, even after the Stonewall riots. The fear of queer prosecution continued to drive the minds of the queer community post wall so long. In one raid, an Argentinian national was so frightened that he might be deported as a homosexual that he tried to escape the police precinct by jumping out of, jumping out of a two-story window. The fall caused him to impale himself on a spike fence. One year to date after the Stonewall riots was the very first Pride March June 28th, 1970, held on Christopher Street. Marcia, Sylvia Rivera, and other gender variant queers were pushed to the back of the march due to further discrimination within the queer community. Michael Musto, a former friend of Marcia's, said, there's always been discrimination within the queer community. And in the 1960s, especially a lot of gay white men looked down on people of color. The gay males sometimes looked down on drag and trans. Marcia and Sylvia were told not to march in the gay pride parade because they didn't want drag queens, said Michael Musto. But Marcia and Sylvia pushed through the crowd and up to the front lines, demanding visibility and equality from their own community. Within two years, post the Stonewall riots, there were gay right groups in every major American city, as well as in Canada, Australia, and Western Europe. Currently, the Stonewall Inn still operates as a queer establishment. It was designated a National Historic Landmark in 2000, eight years after Marsha's death. Donald Bell of Chicago, a former Dean of Students, stated that the Stonewall called attention to a group of people who lacked basic civil rights that's why Marsha's visibility and advocacy remain important, he says. She and a number of others who lived at the intersection between racism and homophobia were political agitators that helped advance the mindset of society. Many things are unknown about the events leading up to her death. What has been witnessed has never been investigated and many names and facts are lost to history in regard to their involvement with her case. But what we do know is, on July 2nd, 1992, friends say Marsha appeared normal when they last saw her in Greenwich during the day. Randy Wicker, Marsha's roommate, said he spoke to a witness who saw a known neighborhood mischief maker fighting with Marsha and overheard the man calling Marsha derogatory slurs by the pier on the night of July 4th. The witness stated later that Marsha, the man had been overheard bragging about Marsha 
uh, in killing a drag queen at a bar. Later that same evening, on July 4th, Marsha had spent time with her friends around Christopher Park Pier and then headed to the Stroll, a frequent location for survival sex workers. Witnesses say that Marsha got into a car with a group of white men and that many advised her not to do so based off of their intuition. On July 5th, Marsha was seen again by another witness that claims they saw Marsha looking frightened and walking frantically towards Christopher Park Pier. The witness mentioned that Marsha had stated that two men were following and harassing her. Yet no one was questioned by the NYPD regarding any of the statements made or reported. On July 6th, 1992, just eight days after her last Pride Parade, Marsha P. Johnson, the saint of Christopher Street, her body was found floating in the Hudson River after it was noticed by her roommate that she had been missing for a couple of days. Police came and pulled Marsha's body from the river and later on the concrete. Later, a makeshift memorial was constructed on that very spot to commemorate her life. Without conducting a thorough investigation, the NYPD quickly ruled her death a suicide and closed the case. She was just 46 at the day of her death. Those who were close to Johnson considered the death very suspicious. Many believe that Marsha would not have chose to complete suicide. Days before she was found in the river, Marsha was quoted pondering death in a home video. I don't think they do a good investigation on a gay murder. They think, oh, that is one more gone. When you're gay, it takes forever. I'm very fortunate to be black, gay, and a transvestite to get as far as I did in this world. Johnson's video, she says, I always say, tomorrow is not promised to me. Despite months of numerous attempts to get the police to reopen and thoroughly investigate her case, the community's efforts were unsuccessful. Marsha was cremated shortly after her death, eliminating what little evidence that remained, and her ashes were placed in the Hudson River where she was found. It would be 20 years before police would reopen Marsha's case. In 2012, the documentary Pay It No Mind by Richard Morrison and Michael Casino highlighted Marsha's life through the eyes of home videos and friend accounts of her life. This documentary helped reignite the long fight for justice in Marsha's case. After monumentous community advocacy for the truth and tireless public pressure aimed at the NYPD to open her case, and Marsha's death ruling was changed from drowning suicide to drowning undetermined. Yet, in 2013, the NYPD claimed there was still not enough evidence to indicate foul play in her case. In 2013, Victoria Cruz, a community activist, member of the queer community and former friend of Sylvia Rivera, conducted a massive in-depth investigation of Marsha's, Marsha's case in conjunction with the Anti-Violence Protection Project. Victoria Cruz's road to discovery is brilliantly showcased in the 2017 Netflix documentary, The Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson. The documentary follows Cruz as she digs deeper than any before her in finding the truth behind Marsha's death. It is important to note that the reason we now know so much about the details of Marsha's case and the events leading up to her death should be credited to Victoria Cruz. The show features connections to the mob as possible causes of death, as well as debunking alternative theories. It also takes place eerily during the justice trial for Islan Nettles, a 21-year-old black trans woman who was violently killed by the bare hands of another black person after his friends began mocking him that he attempted to pick up a trans woman. No spoilers, but the man is given only 12 years. Despite Victoria Cruz's valiant efforts to shed light on Marsha's death, due to the overall lack of evidence and investigation by the NYPD and the systematic injustice present in the United States, we may truly never know what happened to Marsha. Since Marsha's death in 1992, 
George Seagal constructed the statues Gay Liberation. The statues were placed in Christopher Park, directly across the street from the Stonewall Inn. The statues represent two groups of people living freely. On February 16, 2000, that same area was declared a National Historic Landmark. In 2015, the Marsha P. Johnson Institute was established. Its mission, to defend and protect the human rights of transgender and gender nonconforming communities. On June 24, 2016, President Obama announced the designation of the Stonewall National Monument. In 2018, the New York City Times published a full obituary of Marsha P. Johnson's significance in the LGBTQ plus liberation movement. Marsha's story is unlike any other, yet her life was a personifying reflection of the black gender variant queer experience. Marsha's life and death represents the many voiceless voices of the queer communities of color. And like so many before her and after her, she too was taken too soon by violence and hate. Her story is one of inspiration, love and pain, one of perseverance, activism, and revolution. She was a guiding light in the darkest of times for so many and reverberated that love across the world in attempts to protect billions of queer people. Marsha's life continues to inspire and motivate generations. Her death was unapologetically tragic, yet her life and legacy will never be stifled. Marsha P. Johnson will live on forever. And when injustice, racism, and prejudice attempt to steal your most basic human rights, you tell them, honey, pay them no mind, you stare them in the face, and you say, I don't bite my tongue for nobody, just like Marsha would have. Thank you. <laughs>